There we go. We are live. Welcome to the Redacted Culture Cast. This is the podcast where we enjoy your company as we talk about some of the uh, finer details that have built up gun culture. Part of the goal and objective of this podcast is to have an opportunity to talk with um, people who exist within gun culture, who have ideas on what we think is right and true and good, and how do we really build a firm foundation of what we believe and what we think about so that as we go forward as a culture and a society, we can make wise decisions and make good, you know, good progress going forward. My guest today is a man who I have um, I've been very encouraged by. If you've been paying attention to the store over at redactedllc.com, he was our first customer, but before he was a customer, I got to know you a little bit better. Um, so would you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, Jack Potter. I am the owner and founder of Gorilla Tactical. Um, we've uh, known each other now for a few years. And um, I think once you started this podcast up, it was kind of inevitable that I'd end up on a, as a guest on here eventually. And I'm looking forward to it. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you, man. There's a there's a certain part of, I think, what we've also started referring to as like gun culture 3.0 or whatever that means is that even when we get into like the social aspect of things of like there's this phrase that I've heard before is that the Internet saved gun culture because you had other, all these otherwise atomized and isolated individuals had a way to connect to each other. Yeah. I think what we're seeing in the same way that the physical side of gun culture is um kind of adopting more like plate carriers or night very night vision and suppressors and when i say kind of it's fully embraced it as in Absolutely. like all full capacity that we're seeing training move from like flat range stuff only where the instructor would have to stop and make a deliberate pause and be like well i can't teach you this because you're not a blah 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 to like oh hey let's go do like um let's do a field class on battlefield or battle drill one alpha or like react right. contact break contact and that's a great development in the same way that we've seen it on that side, I think we've seen on like just the the raw cultural side, much more um, participation in like this guy influenced me. And now we can kind of, you know, I'm not saying kumbaya, circle the wagons, you know, mutual, like we're all friends, but like we're sure. there's a lot more reci re reciprocity between characters of like, I really did appreciate it. And so what I get to say to you is that the way that you started building your aesthetic did actually have an impact on me and how I thought of like, oh, I really am enjoying this new phase of gun culture. I think it's it's neat yep. to see how it's it's um I'm also super jealous of the Pacific Northwest. I love I mean, the area. I just it's so hard to live there right now. I mean, uh, between having a professional media person for a wife um, and living amongst the rainforest that is the Pacific Northwest, or at least this side of the mountains, uh, it makes it pretty nice to do media for sure. Yeah, well, we're in the desert now, and I do love the desert. And so I, you know, if I ever get, if I ever am, if I ever am in the in the position where I get to have a northern house and a southern house, the Pacific Northwest is a calling card. As long as I get to keep my residency, where yeah. uh, I I can own my stuff, right? But I mean, that's sure. a whole different conversation. Um, I'm going to take care of some housekeeping before we get into the depth of the conversation, and let's do that. So. Uh, I'm going to, if for those who are watching, I'm going to bring this up on the page because we're trying StreamYard and StreamYard has worked really, really well and allows me to bring this up. So what you're seeing other than the yellow bar is that we have officially started a Subscribestar account. This is the primary objective of this is if you want to support the show, um, it's a, it's a pretty low cost of entry. And the main focus, though, is that if you like the show, you like what you're doing and you want to just support us so we get to stay away from all the the jargon of, you know, like what happens in this space. Subscribestar is the way to do it. But there's an added perk embedded in it. If you were around when we did season one, operation one, you might have received a postcard. If you've purchased something from us on the website at redactedllc.com, if you've bought any merch from us, I'm going to send you a postcard to kick off the uh let's just say the the mystery of season one operation two um but if you haven't purchased from us and there's nothing on the shop that's really interested to interesting to you you can or if you want to support the show as well head over to subscribe star if you subscribe to us we'll gather your we'll get your we'll get a mailing address to send you a postcard and you'll get started with season one operation two for redacted other than that, the last thing that we have to announce um, 
is that if you if, if 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 this is your first time watching, we are putting together a board, a skate deck with Raid skateboard, a Raid SB, Raid skateboards, and Orion Training Group to do a charity uh, skate deck. This is going to be the only deck we're going to release this year. We've already started putting the design out through the Instagram and all of the proceeds of that will go to the firearms policy coalition directly related to the brace ruling. This is our one skate deck a year. We're just doing the one that will be a pre-order that's going to be coming around the corner here. You've heard it from me. Now let's get to the important details. So Jack, 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 let's go to the right page now. Um, you have like in many in much of gun culture i think in the past we've seen people's titles and positions as sort of a a qualifier for who they are whereas in our day i think we're starting to see it a lot more as context and even that as the case you have your you something of interesting to me is that you used to spend a lot of time on a boat and you weren't like doing the navy thing you're doing something different and now you're build you're homesteading out in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm curious on both a little bit of the story of before that happened and then how you actually moved into that, both in kind of like the relationship thing of like, wow, I'm away all the time, kind of living the adventure. And then you're now you're homesteading, which is an adventure in itself. Absolutely. And how that you know, like impacts gun culture and how like you've seen that time. How has your mentality changed over those years? Yeah, how sure. that happen? So, so first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for saying we're homesteading because I would say what we're doing out here, trying to live as self-sufficiently as possible is a far cry from what I would consider homesteading. Um, but it is a goal that we are working actively towards achieving. So thank you for the kind words towards that. Um, I don't know if I would credit myself as a homesteader yet, but it is a work in progress. Um, but uh, we did uh, four years ago now, we did buy nine acres uh, out in the woods here um, in the Pacific Northwest in Washington state. and um, from that, we completely developed the land by hand. Uh, the only thing that was active on the property uh, was a wellhead that needed to be developed. Um, and, and it was covered in about 10 uh, feet of uh, Himalayan blackberries in the whole area. So we cleared that all by hand and much of the rest of the property, we did the same. But we built um, our small cabin in the, the cutaway in the forest. So it's all we're all surrounded by trees tucked away. Um, and in 2020, we were able to put in a large garden and we have water supply and we have, um, septic on the property. And, uh, so we are working towards this level of more and more self-sufficiency as I think more people should. Um, so like I said, homesteading in progress for sure. I'm not sure I'm a homesteader yet, but we're getting there. Um, but, uh, previous to that, yeah, I spent almost a decade, um, outside of the US, all around the world, uh, primarily working in West Africa, uh, training West African militaries in boarding operations, rib operations, um, vessel inspections, vessel arrests, and how to process um, you know, those, those ships in, in various West African waters. Um, I've also, North Pole, South Pole, uh, Antarctica. I lived in Australia for a while working down there, um, all around Europe as well. And that's actually on my way to Antarctica in 2014 is when I met my now wife. Uh, and she, she was on board the vessel as well as uh, doing media. Um, and she is a tremendous media person. She's from Spain. And that's, again, it's kind of this roundabout way. It was very lucky when we started the company that we had this person on our roster by default uh, to be able to help us accomplish what we're trying to set out to do and, and kind of put our mark on what is, you know, what we're calling gun culture 3.0 or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, living the adventure life was extremely rewarding. Um, I'm almost through my second passport um, and I'm in my mid thirties. Um, so we, yeah, lived that life for many years out of a backpack, didn't really have the stability that we have now. And I think when uh, 2020 rolled around with all of the COVID lockdowns and whatnot, that was perfect timing for us to kind of set our roots here on land. Um, and that's kind of where that change started to happen because what we were doing overseas and all the work on ships, uh, all those ships were grounded. We had friends who were stuck in 
vessels we worked on previously. They were stuck there for six, seven months, unable to leave the country, unable to leave the vessel. Um, and so we kind of consciously made that decision. Uh, we were actually doing a patrol off the coast of France um, in, yeah, late in the spring of 2020, before all the lockdowns took place. And we got back kind of in the nick of time before they started shutting things down and stopping flights overseas. And my wife and I made that conscious decision to say, hey, we're going to stay put um, on our land and work our land. Uh, and it was the right call because we probably would have gotten stuck outside of the country somewhere for months on end. And that would have been not so great. But. Uh, there's a kind of a, a common thread that I see between both like a little bit of gun culture and also in kind of the self-sufficiency. I'm, I'm using homesteading. Sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep using that as a, as a, as a, as a pillar of like, when I think of homesteading, I think of somebody who, um, you know, you may not be like going out and developing the land entirely yourself, but you're building yeah. something that's yeah. yours. And, and that means like you have the self-sufficiency aspect. It's kind of like homesteading is like, um, the the idea of preparedness but for the long term like it's not really just about surviving the apocalypse it's like it's sort of being a pioneer as opposed to as and and, and in our day and age we don't really have any like new land exactly the same way to settle as we have in the past um there's differences there are ex 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 exceptions to that statement but sure. you know I, I think of it as like in both gun culture and both I, 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 I want to say I see this, but within gun culture and the sort of self-sufficiency thing, there tends to be this attitude of I can't get started until I can afford all of it at the same time. Right. Or in, you know, and you know, like it's it's a it's a it's a minor thing, but it happens like, oh, I can't get started training until I have all of the gear. I can't learn how to do battle drill one until I have night vision. And it's like, well, there's there's different ways that that question can be addressed. But for you, as far as like self-sufficiency goes, you went from living on a boat to building your own land, which is a bit of an adventure in itself. How Absolutely. did that, how did you like, what was your mindset going through that? Because how did you think of it? How did you look at it and and, and try to figure that out? Because that seems like, uh, well, we, we can't do it all at the same time, but we'll do it one element at a time. Um, and that's a good, I think it's, I, I just, I'm inspired by it. And I don't, don't mean to be like too, you know, about yeah, it. No, uh, Fortunately for us, we always, well, we weren't always this way, but uh, we were quite handy people and had done a lot of different things over the years, especially with all the work I've done on the ships. Um, a lot of that was able to uh, translate directly over the, the physical aspect of, of work that I would do on vessels, uh, carpentry, welding, you know, various skills like that that I've developed over the years of different things that I've done, I was able to apply directly to what we did here in Washington, uh, which was which kind of gave us that confidence. But otherwise, uh, we had never built a house before. Um, and my now a good friend of mine and my now uh, operations manager, Josh, um, who I think you met at, at SHOT Show, he was down with us. Um, he and I and my wife at the time actually went in on this property and we built two different houses on the property together. Um, so between the three of us building it, we kind of brought all of our various past experiences together and our, our skill sets um, that we've you know derived over the years. Um, and we were able to kind of put those together and build what we did and we accomplished quite a bit. Um, but otherwise we had never built a house before, but we had a dream of it and we did a bunch of research, talked to a lot of people and we said, hey, we can do this. And anything that we didn't know, there's always YouTube. Um, <laughs> so it, uh, it worked really well and, you know, they are really solid houses overbuilt. I must add actually. Um, but I'd rather have it overbuilt than, than underbuilt. Fair. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, we had that, we had that dream to live more self-sufficient, you know, self-sufficiently. And we wanted to, um, be able to fly under the radar and just be kind of, I, I say this loosely off grid because unfortunately we're not fully off grid yet. Um, I don't know that we ever will be, especially with the business. We run the business off of that nine acres as well. We have a new building that's going up currently and we'll be done with it uh, this spring. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, because of the business and, and the nature of things, we probably won't fully be off grid, but there are other things that we're working towards to where not grid dependent, um, I think is a good way to, to state it. Um, so yeah, it's a work in progress. Like you said, 
Yeah, that there's a certain difference in the mindset between people. And I know that a, a couple of characters have had influence on that subject. It, it, this is this kind of returns to the heart of the, the show and the heart of the podcast of like being able to make distinction between terms and what things mean and what we mean by what we say. Because yeah. in many ways, I think like one of the downsides of anti-intellectualism is that somebody else builds the foundation that your house stands on. And so <clears throat> some, somebody else ends up building the, the foundation of your society. It's not just, well, we can just, you know, raw our way through it. Um, and so um, you made the point of it's not necessarily like off. It's not it's not off grid in the sense of like you're not. But it, you're making a difference between being off grid as in like being, quote unquote, off the radar to like not dependent on on it right. as a major difference. The old the old mindset of like the preparedness that I grew up with was sort of the, 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 the off after the afterbirth of the cold war where it meant the only thing you had two options. You could live in the suburbs or you could build a bunker in the woods. Correct. And it was like, you know, none of, I didn't, I grew up in the, I grew up in a rural, rural countryside. We didn't have a bunker, you know? And so, being dependent on this uh, on the ecosystem uh, on on the federal level infrastructure is very different being independent of that is very different than being you know isolated i guess for sure yeah mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i mean i grew up um you know 80s and 90s um in upstate rural upstate new york it's the same thing um we had for lack of a better term homestead in that area too we had 14 acres of where we did all of our own gardening and had all of our own food supply um and a, a business as well that my you know parents had started in the 70s and and ran up until my dad passed away suddenly um a few years ago but um the uh so all those that mindset was kind of instilled in me from a young age um just growing up my sister and i and you know working the family business working the farm um and just having that that ability to think for yourself, work with your hands, and then put that practice, uh, you know, to action. Absolutely. So, so I, I, I here's a, here's a good question. Then, how what how much of how as far as it comes to vegetables and greens, like you've got your garden, how much yep. of that, on estimate, it, does that how much of your daily or your 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 normal like diet are you are you providing for through your garden? So last year, unfortunately, was a true, like an absolutely atrocious year for gardening. Um, okay. So I'm sad to say that less than 20% uh, through the growing season was achieved through our, our current garden. We have a big space. We also have fruit trees um, and other things on the property as well that we've, we've grown there. Um, mm -hmm. The previous year to that, though, 2020 and 2021, massive yields. Um, just things worked out last year. Last spring, we had a really cold spring and it, then we had a second frost that killed a lot of the starters and you know that's the that's the nature of gardening or homesteading um something that i've grown up with my whole life more or less and that's sometimes the way the cookie crumbles unfortunately um so one thing we learned from that is my wife is ex super into foraging um we live out here in the pacific northwest and there are countless edible plants um and you know different wild fruits and vegetables and things that are at our fingertips that she really dove into last year and learned a whole bunch about it's a it's a hobby of hers and she does well at it um so because the garden failed so miserably last year we were able to pick up a lot of that slack from naturally grown plants and you know fruits and vegetables in the area as well that we supplemented with that being said, we were still doing, you know, grocery store trips every two weeks or whatever. It's just the nature of things. But mm -hmm. again, it's like this interesting level of self-sufficiency that a lot of people don't realize that often right outside your own. Oh, no. I think I can hear you now. Yep, we're back. All right, cool. You're good. You're good. Yep, and it'll probably the last time this happened, it actually did catch all your text, but I'll still check it over. So, okay. in the event that it's lost, um, in the event that it's lost, you were talking about you know there, there's this whole world of self sufficiency that you're right. that like is kind of 
unbeknownst. Uh, and I don't know if I'd say it's un, it's unknown. I'll, I'll kind of describe it from my end, my perspective of like my, maybe my, my, my childhood concept of like self-sufficiency off the land or being able sure. to like go, you know, like pull, go out into the woods and find edible plants and fruits and stuff like that is, is sort of a, this weird mix between not being good at it where I was at and which which only help oh, i'm sorry it's not a mix between it was like in my environment i kind of had some ideas of it like i wouldn't say i'm not good at it like you're a kid you're figuring things out i didn't eat sure. the death berries but um you know being able to learn things like you know spot things like um poison ivy and poison oak and knowing how to like maneuver through these types of environments and knowing how to like okay this grass is like this this is going to be this look for ticks this is edible this is not edible small things but then like in my mind, I held this concept of something like Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, like walking out into the woods and just being like, oh, yes, missile fight field grass bush. And you like, this will cure asthma. And then this just get you for three weeks, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, 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 and I'm sitting out here playing in the backyard is it, you know, in, in the in the in the, you know, acreages around where we lived because we were in a rural area. Like, I'm not going to live off of grass. I'm going to go home and I'm going to eat food. So. <laughs> Um, so how did that, like, how did, like, what was it like watching that happen? Cause you, you, you said your wife is from Spain. So there is some cross pollination of what's out there, but not everything. Yeah. No, so what was sure. that like for her and for you looking at self-sufficiency through this new lens of like trying to figure it out? Well, I think that, um, I think it was an easy transition for us in that regard. Cause it was something that we were interested in. So. Uh, we're fortunate to live where we live because there's so many edible plants um, out there that you can, you know, eat. And not only edible, but also uh, medicinal as well. That's something else that she's really into. Um, so between the two things, like it was a, it was easy for us to do because it was kind of like a fun thing. We, we walk a lot, um, you know, for time spent together, but also for exercise. And um, so we kind of just add that into our our kind of nightly walks around, we'd say, she'd say, Hey, this is a, you know, whatever tree and this is this grass. And, you know, she maybe would bring something along and harvest things along the way and kind of make a fun little almost game out of it. Um, that, uh, then she would come home and cook some like amazing, like nettle soup or something. And it was, it was like restaurant quality in my opinion. So I was like, this is cool. Like we're not paying for it. It's right outside and, uh, it's super healthy for me. So I'm, uh, I'm into it. You know, it's all about that self-sufficiency. I'm, I'm into every aspect of it in that regard. So there's, there's a bit of, um, I, I know, I know it strays a little bit too much into politics because it tends to be like, you know, and it just, it tends to come up in like a kind of a political sure. or political adjacent conversation of like, you have to know where your food comes. And why I say it's political is like, you'll hear somebody like Mike Glover talk about it, who's not overtly sure. political, but then you'll also hear somebody who like on the right, they talk about, well, we need to know where our, our, our things come from. Or like, right. you know, Joe Biden gives a president, the presidential address and people are like, yeah, but what is the cost of eggs? And like all sure. of this kind of stuff. Right. So, yeah. so like, instead of straying into like the, the overt criticism side of it, how have you seen, like, how have you personally observed the differences in like self-sufficient foods versus grocery store foods? And like, how did, how like the health quality, do you grow your own meat? How does that work? Well, for one thing, as somebody who has spent so much time outside of the U S and all over the world in different cultures, experiencing other foods and other cultures, um, all throughout Europe as well, because my wife is European. So I've been there countless times, uh, Spain and, and everywhere else in between. Uh, I will say that the food in the United States has a bunch of garbage added to it that you would not normally find in other places. Um, and that was one thing that she noticed when she moved here. She'd say, hey, I feel I ate this and I feel bloated. I feel like I've eaten this my whole life overseas. I come here, I eat the same thing. And then you start looking through the ingredients list and, you know, the list is this long, you know, this long list of stuff that you can't even pronounce. And you wonder, you ask yourself, like, I don't know, I'm no scientist, but is this good to be putting in my body? I don't know. Right. Um, and I, I'm sure people have different opinions about that and, and, you know, how much they go into their own diets. But so for me, uh, being able to grow our own food and harvest wild food that there are you know, no contaminants, no known contaminants, I will say. There's obviously things in the air, things in the rain, things in the water, stuff like that. Um, 
but without without any known contaminants i think that that's like a much in my opinion it's a much better cleaner way to consume food have you have you tried to have you tried to consider or have you looked at it how like oftentimes it's blamed on the indu- in the industrial revolution and like sure. the indu- in the industrialization of food and sure. like and it, and and I'm I'm torn on this one I'm torn in the sense of like it just doesn't it, it on the one hand I say I don't it, I I don't think it matters in the sense of like you cannot go back to a pre-industrialized world without massive death sure. we're talking about billions of people just dying in horrible ways and you can't ethically argue that that is justified in some massive like you know mass mass we're talking about like starvation of billions like okay war crimes is not sufficient enough for this so so like we can't go to a pre-industrialized food system which is a challenge but so what we're facing now is that we've kind of solved the hunger problem through industrialization but we haven't solved the nutrition problem sure. of we've created new issues. Right. I think. And, and, and so that's why I say I'm torn on it. Is it like, I'm not saying that it, I'm not thinking, I don't think that all of this is good. Like the idea sure. that we don't know where our beef comes from is bad. Sure. We've traveled, I've traveled, my wife and I have had the opportunity to travel quite a bit. Um, not near, I am envious of your travels. We still have to hit the poles, but, um, <laughs> Well, you know, like, uh, we're, but we do have the same experience of like when we're overseas, I tend sure. to feel healthier. When yep. I was in Afghanistan, I always ate the local food first yep. and then let that kind of work through my body and then kind of work into, I didn't always, I tried to. And so like, there are differences in food quality. Sure. You know, there is this thing called foot bread. Don't eat the foot bread. But yeah. But when it comes to our food in this country, it oftentimes I feel like it gets described as such a big problem that you can't solve it or like it's a solution that's only made available to the rich and famous. Sure. And so your 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 alternative is that you're kind of figuring it out on your own in a very long format method. You're not just immediately washing everything out of your house. Unless I'm misinterpreting you, how is that how is like the food solution work like how do you see that on like a cultural span? if somebody lives in an urban environment how do they do that can they would you make any recommendations so i think there's if you're if you're I, there's so many layers to what what you just went over here i'll, I'll try to i'll try to you know pinpoint something. no 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 it's uh it's not you it's just the severity of of the quote-unquote issue you know that we're we're talking about here um on a personal level of someone living in an urban environment uh, with space as an issue who want to get into being more self-sufficient, um, there's a really good book called Square Foot Gardener, I believe it's called. And that kind of sh- just what it sounds like. You can It's teaching you to garden um, you know, efficiently in a very small amount of space because most people have a balcony. Most people have a small backyard to where they live or whatever and, and can accomplish that um even if it's just for one or two people living in the household um so if you want if you're wanting to supplement in there's some good stuff out there as far as how to grow some of your own foods so you have a little bit more control over where it's coming from um on a greater scale like you said i i think we've kind of maybe solved the hunger issue in this country um not elsewhere as someone who's been all over the world i can say for sure that there's a lot of hungry people out there um and that's a whole topic of discussion for another time i think um but as far as like post-industrial revolution obviously we have changed our systems with to do monocropping and the way that factory farming is done um and there's you know, you can feed a lot of people, as you've seen, but like you said, it's created a plethora of problems. Um, so I think it's naive to think that you can go back to everybody having their own large garden because there's too many people currently, even in this country, as far as what's left in land. You know, there's like this whole thing of people are like, oh, well, it's really cool to go live off the land. And, and this is not to knock anyone who's doing this because we're kind of halfway doing it. Um, and I think it's amazing. Um, but 
like it's a little bit of a facade to think that like everybody could go off and you know have their own homestead in alaska <laughs> live fully off the land it's just not not feasible for a lot of people and it's also not realistic as far as when it comes to natural resources and the amount of mouths that need to be fed um so i think that you know again i feel like you could have a whole podcast all about this issue at hand multiple probably a whole series or season of podcasts about this but i feel like the only real way to attack the issues at hand um, with the way that we're producing um, crops and grains and meats and things like this in this country is to kind of revamp and re-gear um, to kind of like an older style of things where people are consuming less factory farmed meats and things of that nature and more vegetable and fruit content because those types of things can be gardened on smaller you know plots of land and using a lot less resources water and um, etc. To do so, um, so I mean, I don't have the answer. I'm again, I'm no, I'm no scientist on the on the matter, but just kind of where I'm standing, it seems like this system, it's a bit of a facade that it works well because people go to the grocery store and they get things off the shelf, and that's where it starts and stops for most people. They don't really understand what's behind it or the or what's happening through the processes along the way. Yeah, and there's another side to it that's somewhat that that is a, quite, has a long term benefit of like if you know where your food comes from, that generally leads to having some sort of community involvement. Like it's sure. not it's not purely economics and the yep. physical logistics of moving you know nutrient A into mouth B. There's also the well, if I know where I get my eggs and I know where I get my food and I know where I can get, I get this stuff there, there, there's a natural, I wouldn't say a side effect. Perhaps the side effect is the food, but the, right. the primary cause is there is this return to community aspect, which mm -hmm. necessarily urbanization, or ne which as far as we understand, urbanization tends to have a detriment to right. where you have to be even more deliberate about who you're participating who you affiliate with when you're not as dependent on them immediately. At least that's the way the theory goes. And I, sure. I find it interesting because of, um, I, I have a personal gripe with higher of Maslow's or Maslow's, depending on how you want to pronounce it, Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. where it's commonly described as, well, if you don't have food, the higher, higher needs are never a concern. And we've almost created like um, an infinity loop out of the issue in our society, in our world here, especially in the West, where yep. you have all of your needs except for the one thing that keeps you alive, which is the desire to live. And therefore, none of the other needs matter and it negates them all. And sure. and it, and it's it's that's a bit it's not a, it's not a full accurate criticism of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In fact, I haven't read his work, so I can't like be a, uh, an, 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 a proper philosopher and address the, you know, the premises or whatever. But sure. I can say that we're finding out that it turns out in the Star Warsian sense, if you lose the will to live, none of the other factors matter. Right. Um, and that's where it comes down to like, what do you think is true and what do you believe in and how do you build your culture and what are your values and what do you focus on? Yep. And so, I think that's a good way to shift a little bit in, you know, this is, this is primarily a gun culture podcast yet. We're talking about homesteading and gardening and all these other things. And part of the reason why that's interesting to me is because what we refer to gun culture is continuously and gradually expanding. And mm -hmm. as um, Fred from counting coup said, he said that like the goal would be that in 10 years time, there is no gun culture. It's just Americana. Sure. Uh, and that's a paraphrase on my end. So how how did you go from doing the international thing to then running Gorilla? And like Gorilla does multiple things, but you're mm -hmm. you, you you make holsters. That's that's one thing, right? You also mm -hmm. have a you do have an excellent media presence, but you also you do more of these things. Like, how did that start? Why did you choose this? And where did you go to that? How did you get? Is that something that you could talk about? Sure, absolutely. Um yeah, I mean, Guerrilla Tactical is an I realistically, it's an idea I had well over 12 years ago that never came to fruition. Well, I mean, I say never, it, it has now since 2020, mm -hmm. but uh, for all those years, it didn't. I actually did 
work um, for my dad years ago and in trade for my labor, I said, I need some tools. And he said, okay, I'll trade you these tools that you need. And these tools, of course, were a bandsaw and a sander and things that I wanted to use to make my own holster, you know, holsters. Um, so this is before I started working primarily overseas and getting on ships. Uh, that opportunity came along and the idea of doing anything with Kydex was put on the back burner and it became a forgotten thought. Um, so fast forward a bunch of years and 2020 lockdowns start to happen and they start canceling travel like we, we touched on at the beginning of the show. Um, and all the ships that I was working on were grounded. And uh, we made that conscious decision to say, hey, we're not going to leave the country again for the foreseeable future because we do not want to get trapped outside of it and away from our home. Um, so we, I was making, I said, hey, you know, I'm not one to really sit around and twiddle my thumbs and, you know, wait for the next thing to come by. I'm, I'm someone who wants to do stuff and, and be active and engaged. Um, so I was making pretty high end knives um, for a while. Um, it was like a hobby of mine. It was kind of an art form. I was selling them as well. It was it was putting money and food on the table and and uh, you know paying bills. Um, and I was having a lot of fun doing that. And I was using Kydex to do the sheets for the knives. And funny enough, still utilizing some of those same tools that I traded uh, labor for for my dad years and years ago. Um, so. I was doing these knives and, and I was making these sheets and it was going well and it was fun. Um, and before you know it, some people were like, Hey, would you be able to make me a holster for my Glock 19 or whatever? You know? And I, I was like, well, I mean, I'm making them knife sheets. So probably um, the process is similar at the time we were doing foam pressed, um, you know, knife sheets. And uh, I said, hey, if you buy the mold for the, buy the blue gun prop or whatever, I can probably make your holster for you. And they said, okay, cool. So I'll do that. Um, so I did that for a while. And before you know it, it was, I don't know, a few months, a couple of months had gone by of doing this and word of mouth was spreading. And um, it, and before I knew it, I had a, a bunch of these blue gun molds, you know, sitting around and I was doing these for people. And I thought to myself, you know, this is actually something that people want. Um, and I think that people got this feeling that I was like a different, a different approach to somebody in the gun space. Um, and I do consider myself to be not that, you know, cookie cutter gun guy. I uh, grew up in the punk and hardcore music and grew up a skateboarder. Um, so when I'd see, you know, a, a crack or a crevice or a, a rail or a stair set or whatever growing up, it would be something that I wanted to make my own and, and, you know, and, and trick off of, uh, skateboarding wise. And, uh, as I started to move into the gun space, I, I had grown up with firearms. Um, you know, grew up in rural New York and built some of my first rifles when I was a young teenager and I lived in Texas for a while. So I built a bunch of guns and we shot a lot down there when I was living there. And, um, but to apply kind of my mindset growing up, I wanted to kind of put that out into the gun space with Guerrilla Tactical. I wanted to be a little bit of a different vibe or a different company, uh, but also a company that manufactured a high quality product, um, stood by our product and had approachable quality customer service. And uh, but kind of put that punk rock attitude kind of into the gun space, say, hey, this is these are well, how we think, this is how we want to live, and this is, this is how we're going to apply it to the real world. And if you think it's cool, then vibe with us, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, and that mindset has kind of really shifted into what is now an extremely successful business, and a lot of people relate to it, um, which is kind of cool to see because it's three years now we've been in this space, and it's growing every single month. I mean, we're way up. Um, you know, on sales this start of this year than we were last year. It's over three times amount already. So it's like every year has been has been gaining and growing, which is great to see. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm here. I am on this podcast with you. We've gotten to know each other, and uh, I think you could probably attest to that as well. 
So, uh, it's an interesting subject that like and yeah. and i have to admit that there's also like in case i haven't informed you there's two ways that the word interesting is used there's the rest of yeah. the world and there's like the midwest and the midwest is always like sure. dismissal so i don't yeah. mean that actually i, I mean yeah. it in, i mean it in like the genuine sense of there's a there's a there's quite a few holster companies that have come yeah. and gone some of them have stick, stuck around some of them emerged whatever right but like one thing that is pretty consistent across holster companies that I've seen recently is how they present themselves. Right. And so like, it's, it's, it's not meant to be the main topic of conversation, but like in a negative sense, you have the tribes in the positive sense, you have different, um, different people or different, different companies serving different people. Right. Like, sure. There's this, I think of it in this way as, and by the way, like I don't have any expertise in this, so it's just trying to think about how I think about it. But there's this idea that if we can just make the best mouse trap, we'll have, we'll have, there's, there's like two very aggressively different per, uh, opinions of right. like, it's all marketing or it's all engineering. We have the best mouse trap, but you piss off everybody you talk to, or we have the best marketing company, but everything we make is trash. And like, yeah. There's no company that I know, or there's no manufacturer or people like you who build your own stuff that I know that does both of them terribly. There are some that do one of them good, but the ones that I admire are the ones that do both well. They figure out both ends. And like right. marketing can be a dirty language because it Absolutely. can be pretty gross. But at the same time, there's also like a like a I'm I'm there are people who need to figure out how to get the thing. And sure. And, and if I can help that, I can help that. Right. And so, you know, not all marketing is madman cynicism. For sure. Just, but there's plenty of examples of that being out there too. I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm from us. Um, what we want to give people is we want to give people the real deal. Like, we're not here to um, say one thing into another, um, we're not here to appeal to everyone. Um, we're here just to be real. Uh, if you hit us up on a DM or a email, um, I'm typically the one who's going to respond. And that's something that I constantly am told as the company grows is people appreciate the ability to reach out to us and know they're going to get an answer and know they're going to be able to have a conversation, um, oftentimes with me. Um, and that's something that we wanted to make sure. And I, I can't say for sure it's going to be that way forever as we get busier and busier. Um, but uh, I'm, I always try to do my best to be uh, approachable and uh, available to our fan base, to our customer base, um, because we are 100 percent for the people. Um, and that's something that we've wanted to instill in the company from day one, um, that we are creating this uh, this space of inclusivity to where people can come out and they can ask the questions that they might feel ashamed to ask as a new gun owner. Um, or they can make mistakes uh, when it comes to their training and they can not feel ashamed by coming to us and saying, hey, what's the story with X, Y, and Z? And we'll answer all those questions for you as best to our ability um, because we want to cultivate a better, less toxic space in this country to where people are becoming more prepared, more self-sufficient and just educating themselves on how to live their lives maybe I hesitate to say better or maybe just in a more positive way. Um, the, uh, so that, I mean, that's, that's, that's one thing that we wanted to do when the company start took off, uh, five, six months into the company of me doing it myself, I needed to hire on someone full time. Uh, and then from there we've just continued to grow. Um, and that's the one thing that we have always maintained that we are here and readily available to help people as they come into the space and, and wanting to acquire training, firearms, um, knowledge, medical supplies, whatever it's, we're not just here to make money. It is, it is a for-profit company. It is the only thing that I do with my time currently, uh, as far as like putting food on the table, but we are here and we acknowledge and realize that we would not be here without the ongoing support. So we, we don't ever want to put that by the wayside. Yeah, when you you it's a false it's a false dichotomy is what right. it is. You, yep. it, it, it's a false dichotomy. It's in the idea of like 
a business either makes money or it serves the people is a 100% false dichotomy. Right. There are examples of people who corrupt the system Absolutely. where the, there are examples of people who, you know, sell out or corrupt the system. They forsake their commitment to what they produce for the sake of a, 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 a but we have terms for those. Sure. We have, we have terms for a cash grab. We have yep. terms for a sellout or a shill. We have terms for, you know, a, um, we have, we, you know, we even have like off brand terms like Chineseium or, or whatever. Right. And, and so the thing about it is that there is the virtue and then there's the uh, corruption of the virtue. Absolutely. And those are two yep. different things. Yep. So you, we, we do not live in a binary between you either make money or you do what you love. But you, you know, but you, and you can certainly do one or the other. Right. I just, I don't, I, I think it's a false, I think it's a false dichotomy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the same problem that you have like the communism thing. It's like your idea is bad. So mm -hmm. moving on, you know, your idea that all capitalism is the corruption, not your personal idea. I know this isn't you, but like the yeah. idea that all capitalism is the necessary enslavement of people is like, that's not even a functionally good idea moving on. And so I don't want to like waste time on it. I think that's a good yeah. place to yeah. be. I, I think that on social media and we are in the age of social media um, across the board, you're going to find this, this desire or, or level of moral purity uh, that is simply only found on the fantasy land. That is the internet. Um, mm. And that's not the real world. And so we're we're trying to we're not trying to necessarily push any narrative through the company we're just trying to be as real with people as possible and just say hey you know what like the the principles that i were instilled with me growing up um through my parents especially was like a good hard work ethic but also just to want to want to better yourself and always wanting to be as the best possible version of yourself for you your family your friends your media community or just people in general um, and that's kind of the narrative we're trying to push through the company. If, if, if there is any narrative to be pushed um, is that we can all be better versions of ourselves, and we can all be better people to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing to remember as we continue to go down this path of stricter gun regulation, stricter gun laws, trying to push through, et cetera, et cetera, is the United States is made up of a, wide variety of ideology and that's something that is part of the part of what makes this place unique in in comparison to a lot of places in the world and that's totally fine um but it's important to remember that we have in a sense need to band together uh more so on a larger scale to when we're talking about this inalienable right to self-defense or the weapons to do so um and that without on the without getting too political here on the podcast, uh, there is a governing body in the country. And if you look through history, governments do want a monopoly on violence. And right now, through lots of different media outlets and whatnot, there's a large wedge driven um, between people in this country. Um, and the division is going to be the death of a lot of our rights if we don't try to stick together a little bit better uh, moving <clears> forward. So let's kind of let's talk about like the foundations of those ideas yeah. instead of going. You know, I, I know we want we're, we're always careful about how we address like the political, and I think yeah. like I think we were saying earlier like the biggest concern that I have about politics is that it just turns into sure. the right, the left, the yeah. this, the yeah. libertarians, and it's sure. like, tell me what you believe. And then let's have a conversation about it. Right. And I'll tell you what I believe. Right. And when it comes to multi here's like, I, I think of, I think of some things as like Gutenberg revolutions. And what I mean by Gut Gutenberg revolutions is you can't put the cat back in the bag. You can't, right. you can't put the, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And like right. the multiculturalism of America mm -hmm. can essentially, what's the word? Um, balkanize mm -hmm. to regional things, but that's, extremely weird like that it's i don't know if we would see it we don't exactly have an idea of what that would look like and even right. if we did i don't know if we would advocate for it right maybe i i don't it's i'm not fully committed to that subject sure. but what i am i am concerned about is that okay so we have 
multiple cultures. We mm-hmm. have they can be described as religions. We have Catholics, Protestants. Um, we have Muslims, Buddhists, Everything. New Age, New Age. We have spiritualists. We have yep. all these different things, right? We yep. all and and this is kind of a problem with like what you would refer to as secularism or secularization theory, which I'm kind of reading on lately. So that's that's kind of beyond the point, sure. but. The, the the issue with all of these different belief systems is that they all have different foundations for what they think is true. Mm-hmm. But then what they could all they could still all come to the conclusion that the human right to self defense is inherent in being yes. human, and right. therefore agree with that on that line, and then move Absolutely. together on that line on the concept of rights. Right now, what happens then? The real question that we're facing is what happens when a section of that population whether by injection, venom, or by rot, poison, or whatever, starts festering an idea that is antithetical to the genome of the city or of the population. And that's what it looks like with gun control in the situation of like, I don't know, the Americans are less, should seem to be less concerned about where you pray at, which is, this is an entirely different ethical question. Sure. Then whether or not you own then whether or not you believe in human rights and that becomes an a philosophical problem of well if you don't if you don't ground your rights in what i believe what do you ground them in sure so how do we do how would you address the idea of like how do you think of it as as far as a cultural problem when it comes to um we have multiculturalism on one hand mm-hmm. and that necessarily means that some of those people in that culture hate what you think is good how mm-hmm. would we even resolve that i you know i think I, that's the question that we're facing today i think unfortunately i don't think that's something that we could even begin to get into on a two-hour podcast again i think that's that's something that could be a whole series in itself um and and there's many layers to these types of of issues um my personal belief is one of anti-force so my personal belief and that's one reason why we live where we do and and live how we do is because i have the ability to self-govern over me and as a team with my wife and our family maybe my immediate friends working together immediate community um but as a, as a proponent of a belief based on lack of force, I don't think it's right for me to force you to do anything that you don't agree with as long as you're not hurting somebody else in the process of it. Now, there's many layers of are you hurting someone else? That's the issue, right? Mm-hmm. And again, I think that it's not something that we can even begin to scratch the surface of all those layers on a two hour podcast, unfortunately. Um, and I don't know what the answer is per se. And I don't know what it looks like on the other side of whatever that may be. I don't claim to have those answers. I just know on a personal level, I can live my own life as true to that as possible. Um, and that's one issue that I see with, I mean, it happens all over the world, but you know, let's talk about the U S cause that's where we live. Um, is that one group of people want something for themselves, or maybe they agree on something like gun control or lack of gun control, as it should be, right? Um, but then one other, one of some of that, one of those groups may disagree that someone else is doing something with their own life, and I, I'm of the belief that we shouldn't go reaching and and you know, put that overreach onto the lives of other people um, because we're all just people here trying to put food on the table and get by day after day. We all have our own internal struggles. We all have our own family issues. We have our own community issues, um, health problems, whatever, right? So on the simplest of terms, I would never go looking to stop someone else from doing something that they wanna do with their own life as long as it's not hurting somebody else. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's, I mean, that's kind of, that's, I try to live that way. It was instilled in me from a young age growing up with my parents. And I try to live that way every day. Um, 
I don't know that that really fully answers your question, but I'm not so sure I have the answer to your question, especially in a two hour podcast. Yeah. I mean, I know we are constrained in a little bit by yeah. time, but, and, yeah. and, 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 and this is, a, this is kind of one of those subjects where I find it like, I find myself interested in more and more conversation on this subject sure. because it can very quickly just dis, like dissolve into platitudes yep. of like, you know, part of the issue that I have, like, for example, one of the challenges that I, I struggle with libertarianism is it's a great ethical structure, but it's not a very great, it's not a very good judicial structure. Mm -hmm. Like do whatever you want. Kind of like sounds nice in the sense of like, I don't have the right, but I don't have the, authority to dictate how you live your life because you're human and i'm a human that functions great but like right. negation of government is not a good form of government and i think that government is is sort of not gonna there's no non-government world like i don't think anarchism functions it's well, too yeah but i uh, would go ahead no, you go finish. Go ahead. <laughs> the reason the, the word i was going with this one is that you've you know you've lived abroad and you've seen multiple countries right and you've seen them in various states of order and chaos. Mm -hmm. And then you've lived in the United States in sometimes a very order and sometimes a very chaos. Sure. Um, or of, of, of ascending and descending chaos. How would you talk? How would you like? How have you seen contrast to multicultural conflicts in other environments than ours and can you make an evaluation on that and saying this is what we've seen as good or not good i mean the reality is everywhere you go has good things and everywhere you go has bad prop has problems um some more so than others and i've been to many places uh in the world that would be considered third world countries um all throughout africa india where it's very humbling to know that you live in a place like the United States. As many problems as we do have here and how many things that can be addressed um, on various levels, um, for a lot of us, we do have it pretty good here in the United States in comparison. Um, that's, not to, that's not to be said that th those problems shouldn't be met uh, head on and dealt with in, in one way or another um, as time progresses. Um, I don't think that, um, I don't think that's not what I mean when I say that, of course, that it's there, but there are good and bad things all over the world. And that's, that's how it is. And like you said, I think that it's like the, the whole, like the government is a necessary evil kind of, you know, talk about that. Um, yeah, you're right. There's not really any functioning countries that don't have some sort of structure because, what would happen it's almost like somebody needs to lead the dance you know um and i guess maybe like in in kurdistan like in rojava they have what is i believe referred to as democratics uh i'm gonna i'm not gonna remember the name um i can't remember the name of, of what it is but uh unfortunately but they have like an interesting way that they run their uh their their society there, which is can, some notes could be taken on. It's, it's fairly free. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, as, as far as democratic conservative, I, I I'm going to have to look it up later. I'm, uh, but, uh, <laughs> would, we're, we're democratic about our vegetables. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I don't, going, I don't, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm not on the Joe Rogan budget. I don't have a Jamie to help me out, but I, I, so they have a, a different format of government. I mean, we're going to government will evolve and I, it, we, we're not here to just simply be talking about government, but it's of interesting course. to see yeah, like, yeah. conflict resolution between peoples. Right. Of course. Yeah. Because you have to, there has to be a way, there has to be a method of resolving conflict. And like, that's one of the things that we, I think about when it comes to, being capable is that you're capable of escalating, but that doesn't mean you have to meet it at that level of escalation. Right. Of course. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's it, everyone negotiates. It's sort of the fundamental argument behind, behind an armed society is a polite society in the sense of like, yeah, we're, we're polite because we're choosing to be not because we have to. Right. You know, of course. Volunteerism yeah. is necessary. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's, that's kind of how I was, I was raised um, throughout the, the nineties was with that voluntaristic approach, um, in my mm -hmm. family. So, but, it's uh, a, yeah, 
it's great. It's a great, it's like the great catastrophes that we've seen in like Eastern Europe and then like the, the Soviet states of like, yeah, they did the thing and they said the thing, but it wasn't genuine. And now generations later are dealing with the scars of it, of, of, of acting the role, but not, not being voluntary, like forced, right. forced, forced conversion to communist communism fails because it requires forced conversion. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, and so like, in this idea it functionally fails every time because it requires it and and uh and so i think that i think just that it's such a consistent problem but i we're kind right. of i'm i'm doing the i'm doing the straying now and i want to get back to yeah yeah no no problem like I, yeah. ethics and use of force right De democratic confederalism i just remember it confederalism <laughs> if anyone wants to look it up democratic confederalism it's it's interesting yeah um but uh yeah um yeah i don't know it's uh I, I don't i wish i had more answers to life's problems in that way but um and it's an interesting one because i i feel that i'm somebody who possesses common sense and you know unfortunately not everyone possesses common sense so i'm able to look at things and and think to myself like how would i react to this how should i react to this and then react in a way that I think is the right way to go about it. And, um, and it seems extremely ju juvenile that pa your parents teach most people or most kids when they're growing up is like treat other people, how you want to be treated. It's a very basic concept. And that's, that's a thing that we push with guerrilla tactical. It's like, we, we don't necessarily push people away and we, we treat people with, we meet people with kindness and understanding if it's reciprocated. Um, and I think that's, I, I honestly think it works for me in everyday life. And I've had a million experiences um, all around the globe. Um, some negative and most positive with many different cultures and many different people uh, with that approach. Yeah. There's, there's this, I, I, I pre, I appreciate the, I, like the input on how you've been able to like address it. I mean, it's definitely not, um, it's not as, um, nut nuts and bolts as, 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 as the work that you do with gorilla on the physical side. But I mean, it's, this is where we're at now. Like if we're not going to, if we're not going to have these kind of conversations, but we think is right and true and good, right. they will be had by other people who will then build the foundation upon which gun culture is, is constructed. And, sure. uh, you know, and it, and it probably won't be in our favor. And so like, that's, this is gun culture, right? This is who we are. This is Americana. If right. we don't treat it like our own country in our own land, then it will be ruled by people who think it's theirs. And it's like, hmm, that's not working out too well for a lot of us, especially those of us who believe in like human rights. Mm -hmm. They'll, you know, that the language has now been co-opted by detractors and it's all this hubbub about noise and echoes and, anger and greed of whatever yeah i mean so. there's there's a lot of there's a lot of anger out there there's a lot of reason to be angry um you know kind of across the spectrum and and uh that's unfortunate and it's unfortunate when it comes out as violence um because obviously i'm personally a believer in nonviolence, but i'm not a path of you know pacifist um at all um and i think that that's an important thing to remember as well, um, especially when we're talking about self-defense and tools of self-defense or, or protection of family, friend, and community. Um, and that's that's one of those things that we really push with with the company Guerrilla Tactical is that we're not only um, advocating for um, allowing for a knowledge base and uh, a place to acquire those tools to do so um and just promoting that responsible ownership and owning your actions in that way i i i i'm pretty sure the recording kept it but i lost you for like a frame or two and that okay. might have been the it might be the answer to my question but the question that i have then is like how do you look at it what do you how do you see what do you see things in in what we've talked about is like gun culture 3.0 where people yep. have like sort of solved the problems that we saw that we've seen for a couple of years like not i'm not saying that we've solved division but like 
no. been a solution in in into the division problem or been a solution to the isolation problem because i i can think of it this way as like man sometimes i just don't know what to do with my people like i, I you know it'd be really cool if we went out and did this and sometimes i don't know what to do and like kind of i'm kind of like idea farming at this point in time sure. of you know what, what what are some what what are, what's some of the the good that you've seen within let's just call it gun culture as a whole where you've seen um less of a focus on the division and more a focus on on what we're what we're doing together well i've certainly seen a plethora of people along the philosophical um spectrum getting training and getting armed and and waking up to the fact that uh these are inalienable rights that we all have in this country and we should take full advantage of that which has been a good thing um i think uh because i'm a firm believer that uh when it comes to gun rights in this country the more guns there are the more responsible gun ownership there is it is going to be a better and easier outcome for those of us who want those rights to be respected so that is one thing and 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 some would say that uh it's you know it's the whole thing of like people coming out and saying well oh, i don't want my enemy to be armed or whatever you know what i mean and the reality is i think most people are just trying to live their lives and i think there's a finger pointing back and forth of fear from all sides on who's going to do what when and why um and i'm not completely convinced that anything is going to happen in that regard yeah as far that... as go ahead uh, as far as like a civil war ish kind of idea it's a little i yeah. wouldn't i mean i mean i'm not i'm not talking about like a, a, a 1860 civil war i mean like sure. escalated civil conflict yeah yeah uh, yeah I, I mean during during 2020 the new all, all the only thing that was happening was the news was blasting out the worst of the worst every single day 24 7. so it's very easy between that and doom scrolling on social media it's very easy to get wrapped up in a lot of negatives and a lot of you know bad stuff happening on all over the map you know um and so i think that Things seemed extremely dire um, during that year and into 2021. Um, and it was a big unknown, you know what I mean? It was a big unknown like, hey, is this the right concoction of everything happening right now for some sort of fractured conflict to, to kick off in this country in, in, in some shape or form? It, yeah, absolutely. Possibly it could have been. Um, fortunately, it did not. Um, because I'm sure you can attest uh, in your your prior service and working overseas and, and the things that I've been involved with and seen overseas. It's like the people here who were, for lack of better terminology, fantasizing about this bloodlust for violence and almost calling for it. It's like you don't want that here on <laughs> in your in your homeland. You do not want you do not want that violence. You don't want to open up that box. Um because well, the, there was yeah. a very stark. I was in Minneapolis in 2020. I, I, that's yeah. where I lived in, in Minneapolis. Yeah. So 2020 to 2021, there was a there was a very stark difference. Mm -hmm. And this is this is sort of the ethical dilemma I ran into. Of there's a very stark difference between the people who were capable of violence, right? And I mean capable there, there. Very. I'm not like oh well, I could go do a thing, but the people sure. who were capable and aware of their capability for violence, and the people who called for it. Sure. And 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 what I'm trying to say there is that there were there were there were it was the the distinction between population the population of the city given mm -hmm. it uh, on a broad brush from residents to tourists whether they were conflict tourists or journalist tourists or whatever the 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 proper distinction was not between the armed and the unarmed right the uh, it was not between the capable and the incapable it was between the people who called for violence and the people who didn't and the people who called for violence also presented the attitude and demeanor as if they were either not going to or were not capable of it mm -hmm. whereas the people who were very capable of violence were very private and very very concealed 
Sure. I'm not talking about just concealed carry. They just they right. they were very much so like they were aware of the conflict level and what they mm -hmm. what would or could change. And mm -hmm. then there were the people in the middle that caught a lot of attention who mm -hmm. crossed that barrier frequently. Whether they were people who came down to go do the violence and ended up immediately getting rolled up and thrown into a prison cell for 18 months, mm -hmm. or there are people who called for violence and then got carried and then then went to go do it. And in the language of the meme at the time, they fucked around and found out like that's mm -hmm. what it was. And so there were, and then, so the issue being said is that the ethical dilemma, the ethical dilemma that came out in 2020, at least in Minneapolis was there were people who were capable of violence who did not advocate for it. And then there were those who advocated for violence who believed they were not going to be capable of it. Sure. And so those people caused the destruction. I could never hurt somebody, but I'll throw this Molotov. Right. Oh, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm, I could never kill somebody, but I'll beat a store clerk to death. These kind of conversations is what it really played out to. It really played out on that ground level thought of like, we don't want the violence. There were people who were, there were people who called for violence who were not held responsible for the violence they insinuated. And there are people who did not cause violence and who were vilified for the capacity to do worse. And mm -hmm. That's such a strange outcome. And I don't know what to yeah. do about it. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that either. <laughs> I think of it in gun culture and what you're doing here is you're saying that like one of the things that it is, I, I'm sorry if I just kind of stole the, the words no. of it, but like what I saw from you is this in this argument of like, we're not we're we're seeing more people get involved in gun culture regard with 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 different you know foundations and backgrounds there is the ethical question of what is it that you what is it that you could believe that would disqualify you from participation in this and i could, i could probably reduce it to two ideas you don't mm -hmm. believe in a human right to own to to self defense therefore you are an antithesis to what we believe and two right you don't believe that people have rights or that you or or conversely that you have the authority over determining who does and doesn't have rights and those would be two things that if you think you get to choose who has rights i wouldn't want you welcome now i don't mean that it's it, it's, it's pretty obvious when we see that the other yeah. one is that you were you're not welcome if you don't believe that you know we have the rights and when i saw people who do this they were very clear examples it wasn't people who believe voted who believed this. It was that person. I know that person. That well, person I would not welcome in because of what that person holds to be true, and that's well, the you, danger. You can see it um, on a smaller scale here in Washington State because we are for the last few years they've been trying to push through some pretty strict. Um, or more restrictive, I should say, gun laws uh, and uh, in legislation here in Washington state. And one thing that happened with 2020 was with all the shutdowns, a lot of companies changed their you know workforce to a working from home workforce instead of coming into the office and then very quickly realized, hey, we still get the same or if not better productivity from our employees without the overhead. So why would we go back to bringing people into the office? Um, so a lot of these companies, especially like tech companies and, and design companies and design firms and stuff um, that were located in you know central northern California, um, a lot of these people fled California, which was you know it's a very expensive place to live, you know amongst other you know problematic parts of it, um, and they fled. You know, surprisingly, went to Texas a bunch, but uh, up here a lot of people came to Oregon and Washington from those those types of uh, places. So what's happened is a lot of people have come here and moved, continue to move to Seattle, Portland, um, uh, uh, and those, those types of areas, and they're becoming a large voting force. Um, so it's adding to um, a lot of liberals who, in neoliberalism that is already prevalent in those places, and those people are then starting to help in a large way decide for the rest of the rural, uh, you know, parts of these states, what you can and can't own or what you can and can't do. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And that's one thing that we're seeing here a lot because we're dealing now with they're trying to push through a, you know, quote unquote, assault weapons ban, a permit to purchase and uh, a few other very restrictive um, policies like that. So it's an interesting one to see for sure, because these are people who have come from a place where firearms weren't prevalent. And in most cases, they probably never had to worry a day in their life about any sort of protection or, or uh, a need for protection. Um, and then therefore they're like, Oh, well, all the shootings and this means this, and this means to do better, we can just get rid of guns. And, and it's just like, you clearly have no real underlying understanding of how this works or any sort of, um, you know, memory of past history that has shown that this does not work the way that you're proposing. Um, well, it's, it's also d- uncomfortable that your emotional reflex to seeing right. something that you don't like is authoritarianism. Like right. that's, that's, I, I find that like, like the, that your reflex is immediately go to authoritarianism. Okay. Well, yeah. something bad happened, make it illegal. Like, yep. You're not that you, it means you have no interest in, 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 in effective long-term solutions. It's yep. just ban it. I don't like it. Well then no, you shouldn't this be is, voting. This is scary, ban it. You know what I mean? Or this is whatever the, whatever the reason may be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, it, and that just goes right back to the same kind of thing that we touched on before of this, this idea of, and it's, it's not a perfectly formulated and finished opinion, but The idea of if you're anti-force, then by default, I believe you're anti-authoritarian because you shouldn't, I should not force you to do something that I don't like simply because I'm scared of it or simply because I don't know enough about it or I'm uneducated on something that you're interested in or something that you do in your own life. So what right do I have to take that from you? And that's the same thing with with the gun grab idea. So. Mm -hmm. I could, you couldn't blame somebody for wanting to move to your part, neck of the woods. No pun no. intended. Cause it's a beautiful land. Like it's a beautiful oh, countryside. It's incredible. Um, yeah. And so like, you couldn't blame them at all for that. And and there's a, there, are, and it's just, it's not a reasonable solution to say, keep, you know, build a wall and keep them in California. Like that's not like, no, and it's just, okay, dude. But, but, and that's also no less authoritarianism, uh, authoritarian, so there is. And so like, even I, th- I like your idea. I think there's some merit here, especially in regards to like culture and ethics regarding to like, we do want participation because when people participate in the culture, they become aware, they, they, they become more aware of their own capacities and therefore are sort of necessarily bound, or at least it's very obvious when they r- ignore their individual responsibility to something. Right. And, and, and gun culture is very good at policing its own, sometimes overzealously, sometimes underzealously, um, to, to recognize like, Hey, I mean, I, you know, we're not all FUDs when we say that, can you not do that? That's, that's not safe. Like we're not all FUDs when we say that. Some, some people are definitely are like no questions about it, but you know, but it is, I think that you're, you're like, I think that a benefit, a cultural benefit is that the more people are involved and as Mm -hmm. gun culture grows, the more they're aware of, oh, maybe I shouldn't so flippantly call for like death to the patriarchy or, or the hetero patriarchy or whatever your word is today when you're like. That means I might have to like, you know, do something about it. And like, no, I don't want to be the guy to do something about it. That's horrible. You know, I don't, the, the only way to achieve my utopia is the death of everybody I don't like. Well, that's not utopia. That's yeah. And yeah. And absolutely. That's, that's absolutely not utopia. And, and what is utopia? That's a whole nother question because people have different ideas about what that is and is it even achievable? Right. Um, but the one thing that I think is, is, sufficient to say is that in my lifetime, probably in our lifetime, we're not probably going to see some revolution in the United States and whatever this, I, I think people have a, a great way of existing and carrying on and there's going to be ups and downs. And I think that's what we're going to see. And I think there's that meme that says, you know, if you think this is bad, it's going to get a whole lot worse. And I don't unnecessarily, I don't necessarily disagree with that because I do think that we are headed in a more negative direction um 
worldwide. I don't necessarily mean strictly here in the United States. Um, and we will have ups and downs along the way. And that's how it has been since recorded history. Um, but I think that like, as far as on a personal level here and what people can do is they can get more involved in their immediate communities and they can reach out to people who um, maybe are a little bit on the fringe of interested in firearms, interested in, in what it means uh, to, to be a responsible gun owner, why the second amendment is in place um, and be a steward for um, that kind of gun culture. Because like we just established, I think the more people who have involvement and the more people who are a little bit, you're removing that mystery from it. It's like the whole thing of like, well, when I'm, I don't have any children myself, but I've been told by many people who do, it's like from a younger age, they start to remove the mystery of, you know, dad's handgun or, or mom and dad's rifles or whatever like that. And you responsibly get them interacting with it, the process, cleaning the rifle, shooting the rifle, safe storage of the rifle, whatever that means in your household. Um, those are important things to break down those barriers. And the same thing can be applied to adult people here in the country who maybe are a little bit afraid, but also are interested into why it's so important to be able to possess these weapons in this country. So, Yeah. Hey, from a childhood thing, I can think of my own youth as like, there was a pretty stark distinction between the children that I knew growing up when I growing up, when I was a child who like grew up in the same, like we know how right. guns work, we know what they're for. Yeah. And there were different varying levels of like um, concern or control. But then there was a very stark distinction between those kids and the kids who never grew up with any of it in the home. And like right. the e one funny example from my childhood was, when I was a young kid, I was you know younger than ten. Um, my dad, when I was a young kid, my dad had like a, a you know like a sword on the wall, like you yep. know kind of like oh this is cool you're a kid you know and it had relevance and cultural history and something like that. And so I was is is like the coolest thing. Of course, you know you're like five years old or six years old and you're like oh it's so cool right. Sure. You know, it's a sword. You know, you're you're a boy. You're like, oh, well, you know, the the movie Hercules came out. I have to have it. It's awesome. You know, whatever. <laughs> I don't need to justify it, but like. You know, and every once in a while, my dad would take it down off the wall and he would let me hold it and he would be yep. like, you know, this and he'd talk about it and and, and whatever, you know, and, and then we'd put it back and and eventually, you know, my dad and I would he, he would buy a fencing sword and we'd, you know, fence in the backyard and stuff like that. Well, one time I invited one of the neighbor boys over and I was getting older. I was getting, you know, I was, I was taller. I could kind of get it down off the wall. Right. And so I had like, you know, my my my, my parents had trusted me enough to like everyone you know every once in a while i'd take it off and they wouldn't you know expect anything of it because it'd be i was old sure. enough but whatever you know i wasn't like running around the yard with it or anything it's like oh this is mm -hmm. cool uh and so i uh, like uh, this neighbor boy came over and i was like i handed him the sword he like i took I was like my dad has this it's so cool and so I, I handed him the sword and he immediately just grabbed it and stabbed the couch that's the first thing that he did just took it cool stabbed the couch and it was just like what are you doing <laughs> You know, you're you're, st you're standing there with horror, like you. And, and I, I wouldn't necessarily. It wasn't like malice in the sense of right. like, oh, I hate your family. Die, couch. It was just like, oh, it's a sword. What do you do with swords? You stab things. That's There's a couch. Terrible. I stab the couch, and you're just like, oh, no. So yes, I got in trouble for that. And needless to say, I was not allowed to show anybody the sword anymore. And I think of that in some ways, in some parts of the culture that happens but that happens over time and that's a very big distinction from somebody who that's it that's a very big distinction like there is an element of our american culture that that quite frankly is all that needs to happen is that you need to be able to move from let's just say sheltered or ignorance right Sh a sheltered ignorance of of how things work in this world because right. gun culture does not we do not admire licentiousness or food or, 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 or folly, like open folly. There's, right. you know, there's people who push it, but like, whatever. And then there are people who, you know, but, but like, there's a certain element that it's like, you, you shouldn't be, how am I saying this? There's an element within the, the, the uh, in our American culture that is ignorant of guns, but somehow through some form of immorality believes that they should be in charge of them. And that's wrong. And the sure. question is sorting out the maliciously ignorant from just the ignorant. 
And then, and because there, there is a certain level that, like, I think there is a certain level where it doesn't matter about it. If you don't know anything about it, you shouldn't be voting on behalf of it. And that's a problem. I don't, I just don't think there's an, any, any ethical, ex, uh, there's no ethical escape. You can't say you didn't know, dude, you're 30. You know, the guy in Congress who's saying that the, the, the brace turns it into a machine gun. There's no forgiveness for you. You should not be participating on the congressional level when it comes to firearms, if that's what you think. But we're, and we're trying to figure out redresses of grievances for that one. But on the cultural level, we win in the long game. We're all, we're going to win in the long game. It's just, how do we do it? So I don't know. I kind of hijacked that one. I'm sorry. I felt, I felt just, you got me riled up about it. Yeah. Wait, wait, you're telling me that five, five, six doesn't just blow up heads. <laughs> what do you want? Doesn't just send bodies across the room. Dude, it doesn't even do that in Call of Duty. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, it's just kind of like a flap. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother topic for discussion, the people's voting for things and, and how well that works. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one for sure. And, uh, mm. yeah, I don't – And it, you know, I'm going to say something that – some of your listeners are probably going to find controversial, but I think it's important to be said. And you touched on it slightly before, and we don't have to get into a whole bunch about it, but I think it's something interesting to acknowledge because we're talking on the topic of more involvement, more people who are, you know, into firearms, responsible gun ownership, actual numbers. When you, when you look, when an or, you know, an organization like the ATF, or whatever looks on paper, on, you know, numbers of gun ownership, whatever, um, you know, the, the power numbers talk is that in this country, and, and like you said, you mentioned it before, and I think it's correct in this country, there's very much a distinction of you're either right or you're left. And especially from the right, a lot of people, anybody who's not conservative, right, whatever you want to call it, are the left. And I grew up in the hardcore music scene. I grew up with a plethora of ideology all throughout my life, surrounded by different people and punk and hardcore, political, some not, whatever. And again, traveling all over the world, I've seen and listened to many different people and spoken to countless people and, and different backgrounds and ideas and ideology and philosophy. And the one thing that I see here constantly in this country is that it's that distinction of if you're not right, you're left, if you know what I mean? And there is a full on spectrum in this country of people who believe different things and the reality is splitting, we're kind of getting into the grass here and, and you know, splitting hairs when you get too in depth about it because we already established that there's probably not gonna be some revolution that's gonna take place. And then on the other side of it is what, like we're gonna keep plugging along at some form of what we have right now with ups and downs for probably the rest of our lives. So in my opinion, I'm not gonna to get too up in arms about somebody else's like theory that they've read because that's just something that they're trying to apply to themselves or to their own friends and family group, community, whatever. And that's that's whatever, right? As long as you're not taking that that theory and putting it into action and actually harming others through it, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of different ideas, right, in this country. And that's one thing I think is interesting is that you have liberalism, you have neoliberalism, and that's kind of like those center liberal Democrats um, that are trying to take away our rights to guns in this country. Like that's that's the biggest demographic of people who are not in the know and are trying to grab guns away from citizens in this country. And there's a lot of people on the left who the right would consider the left who are in love with firearms and training and own or armed to the teeth and whatnot. And they understand that inalienable right to self-defense. And we own a company that's front facing in this industry to think that we sell to one only one demographic or the other we have a website that people can go on to like what they see and buy something so mm -hmm. as you can imagine as you can imagine as a company that's very approachable in this in this space we talk to a bunch of different people about stuff like that and that's one mm -hmm. thing that what i've said is always important to 
for us as a company is that we're very approachable. And if people want to talk about their ideas and, and, and think commonalities we might have, then we're, we're here for it. That's one reason why I think it's fun to do these podcasts. Um, but that's one distinction that I find is to be untrue is to say, if you're not the right, then everyone else is on the left and wants your guns. And that's simply not true. Um, so it's like when you're talking about numbers, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of people from all different backgrounds and, and beliefs in this country who, who love guns and do not want guns taken away from people. So there's a way that this conversation could get derailed. Yep. Um, and it could get derailed and, and our, and I'm, 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 as you were describing it, I'm, I'm, I'm being preemptive on this. Yep. You, I, I think that that argument could get derailed into a, mora, um, a mire of no solutions. And that is the kind of response where, well, it's actually the left that acts that way. Or, well, you know, and this is in some ways, it's a little bit of a meta version of, well, but Donald Trump. Sure. And what I mean by this is saying there is a consistency within what people refer to as, you know, the left. That it is, if you're not. If you're if you're in any way right of Mao, you're not a liberal or you're not a leftist anymore. And it's like, OK, fine, we could we could play this game of which political and cultural party is more inclusive and exclusive and whatever. And we could do this all day long. We could we could we could we, we talk about how, well, I mean, the right is still more accepting than the left or the left is like, you know, they're more exclusive and they they predetermine. And I'm going to I, I want to make sure that we kind of preemptively derail that. I have like one kind of long form question that I would love to hear your answer from. Mm -hmm. And that is in the same way that we look at American culture and that we look in gun culture or in the same way that we look at, at gun culture, we can also see it in Americana and like culture as a whole. Cause really the two are kind of one. Well, they really are one, but that's beyond the pale. Sure. We have seen a progression within gun culture that we would argue is good, that we have moved away from one mentality of kind of some people refer to it as gatekeeping. Some people have referred to it as exclusionary. Some people have referred to it as campy, some whatever. Right. This is just it's kind of like, you know, it's a little bit less on the um, guns is about hunting kind of mentality yeah. to a little bit more on the human rights front. Sure. At the same time, we are seeing kind of this divisiveness, a, a new, a new, a new field being sown, a new field being tilled that could be the the growing field for a new level of divisiveness, whether that's culturally, or in, whether that's in gun culture or Americana. What would you what would you see as an ideal fourth step within gun culture if 1.0 was hunting ish, you know, pre basically the first corruption is the first sin was, well, the second amendment's about hunting. It's like, well, then you miss the whole revolution, but like, <laughs> you know, the first sin to the adolescents going, well, wait a minute to like our generation, which is in full rejection of that thesis to like the next evolution. How would you see that? What what are what are some like pillars of virtue or examples that you would see as like this is a good way this is something that's good? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's it's not an easy question to answer, and I'm not no. sure I'll do it justice. Um, and it's probably a question that I'll later continue to ponder and think. Oh, I should have said this, or I should have you know mentioned this, or whatever, for a while now after this podcast is over. Um, it's a but, hook. I'll get you back on. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I see it's a it's a trap, huh? Um, the uh, the thing that I can see is that to think with a country with a population like this, with so many different ideologies across the board, to think that there will ever be a time and place where every single person is on the same page and you know even cordial or friendly with every single other person is extremely naive and it's i believe probably not achievable um and like you said you you go you go back to this point of you know a while back you mentioned this like eradication of people who you don't agree with right and that becomes its own huge 
human, you know, rights issue, right? And we're not even going to go there because that's that would be wrong. Um, that being said, you, I think the next, my hope is at least for the next step into whatever we want to call gun culture 4.0 would be continuation of these principles of self-sufficiency and self-reliancy where you would not so much need to rely on um, the government for your help or for federal agencies to do things. And you'd be able to self-govern better and, and more efficiently. And you'd be taking your life into your hands that much further. Um, and if and I do think that humans are tribal people. So there's always going to be, you know, bands of like-minded individuals getting together and that's fine. Um, and I would like to see if there are these continuation of bands of like-minded individuals that they're able to coexist in a sense with other bands of like-minded individuals, even if that is separated space completely. And that's just kind of the nature of things. But I would like to see for, people to continue down this path of becoming more, tra you know, better trained, more aware, better equipped, um, solidifying our right to have and bear these weapons of war is what essentially they are. Um, and if you think differently, then you've kind of missed the whole point of <laughs> what, you know, the second amendment is for in this country. Um, and you are free to then live your life as you see accordingly, but I'm not going to tell you what to do or, or am I going to encroach on your own business? Um, and I would expect the same from you. So I think a, a further continuation of that is going to be a good way forward um, in as possible of like a successful progression as we can ask for, I think. So progression, you know, progression implies there's movement in a direction. You can't progress right. without direction. Right. And so right. I think, you know, in, in some ways, the ultimate form of progression is or the ultimate aim of progression would be like a value a virtue. Right. And so we're moving like I think of I, I'm curious on, on your thought on this one, too, then is like at some point in time, we would want to see that virtue of like self resilient or self reliance and self sufficiency seen as virtues we want to see that in the culture and then also somewhat codified in culture where in you're not punished for being self sufficient and the the greatest example of it that we see perhaps this happening now is the idea that a person would defend their own their a, a person would defend their lives and be punished for their capability of doing so it's not that they're, you know, it's not in the legal jargon garbage. It's that the greatest egregious is that you would do the right thing and be punished for it. And, right. and, um, how do you, so, you know, that, and that, and that is necessarily like kind of, it would be nice if pol politics wasn't so distasteful, but perhaps it always will be. Um, but then I would oh. like, I would like to see, you seem to be talking about this in the sense of the next generate, the next evolution of gun culture is going to be more focused on like self-sufficiency and, and, in and, and self reliance as a whole with er, embedded within a, the cultural necessity of community and participation. They're not divorced from each other. Right. And then that would be in direction of the virtue of like, we are, we are humans. We are self-sufficient. We don't need a nanny state to run us, which always divulges into tyranny. And so how, so like, at, would you say like 4.0 or is it like even 5.0? How far, how far ahead do you think we can even look? I mean, I think that's really hard to say exactly how, how far ahead we can look. I mean, I, I'm not even sure that we're, I mean, I think we can kind of see you're on the cusp of 3.0. Um, that we're calling it uh, for maybe it's maybe it's 5.0 or 6.0 to get to that point. Um, yeah, I mean, I I wish I I wish I knew we're gonna we're gonna just keep kind of trying to do our part and and progress in in that direction and and trying to facilitate others um, with the the mindset and tools to do just that um, because I think that it's important to be as self reliant as possible from and not and not even just not even from some 
doomsday prepper mindset or anything from just from a, a, a daily life point of view of if you are your own first responder, like then you need to be equipped with the mindset and the tools to do just that if called upon. Um, and you know, that happens every day on, on small scale things, but on a larger scale thing, as we say, like we reference the meme, you know, like we, we did already of things are going to get a lot worse. You know, they think they're bad. Now they're going to get a lot worse. What does that look like? I don't know. I can't see into the future. Unfortunately, I don't have those, those, uh, ability, psychic abilities or whatever. Um, but assuming that we have ups and downs through the rest of our lifetimes, then do we not want to be as well equipped as possible um, to face anything that may come our way head on? It goes back to what I think you guys, what I see in your company that you, and what you do, your ethos, the ethos that bleeds from your edges is always self-sufficiency is its own moral virtue. Right. And I do appreciate that. Like that is, I know that's going to, I hope that doesn't sound too much like flattery. But I do appreciate that about your company is that like self-sufficiency is its own moral virtue. It doesn't need justification yeah. of circumstance. It doesn't need justification of, you know, something else. It's like it is a virtue. Being self-sufficient is not it's not a it's not a reactionary. It's just it's good. And yep. so it doesn't require a pending apocalypse to justify. It doesn't require things are getting bad. So grow a garden. It's like. You know, it's, 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 it does that you can break it down into scenarios. Sure. Like it's nice to know that if I wake up in the morning and the grocery store is out of peppers, I can go to my garden and pull peppers or whatever the equivalent of that is. I have pickles in the basement or whatever the, the fear that not having to live with the fear of potential starvation tomorrow does open up some things. I think it's great that you guys put that out as far as like it does come out in it it, it does come out in the cracks in the light in the in the bits and pieces. Yeah. So and, it, and I mean that's kind of like a reference growing up in the punk rock in in hardcore music scene as a as a skateboarder avid skateboarder for years. It's like my view of the world is a little bit different than a lot of people in the greater gun space at this very time. You know there there are like a there is a niche group of us within the space which is which is cool to see a lot of like there's a lot of old hardcore kids and stuff who are owning companies in this in this space which is is kind of a, a cool crossover to see and they often cultivate that same mindset i don't know if it's just comes from years of um kind of being aware of alternative ways of, of thinking or viewing the world um but that's kind of what we wanted to do is is through our media and message too is that cultivate those ideas, but also kind of put out that imagery of like, Hey, like you don't have to fit a specific mold um, or what people in the gun industry think you have to fit. You can be yourself and be you and mm -hmm. live a good life and be good to other people and be prepared, be trained. Like you can be yourself and do all of those things. You don't have to be the typical gray man guy with the, you know, vertex backpack in the, you know, like you don't have to be that person. Um, you don't have to be some operator. You don't to, have to be, you don't have to be a military veteran. Who's a white guy, a white dude with a beard and tattoos who has a, you, you know, a, a, a semi nondescript backpack with a, you know, we, okay, thanks. Now my, my entire identity is ruined. Yeah. You don't have to. And I, and I'm, I'm fucking just a white guy with a, a beard and tattoos as well. You know, I'm just a mediocre white guy. Um, but we are trying to kind of cultivate that in this space that you can be punk rock. You can be your own person and living your life the way you see fit. And you'll still have a place in this industry um, or you still have a place in, in this culture. Yeah. As long I think, I think I was thinking about this last week and it's been fine. It finally kind of stuck a little bit and it's been sort of a question on like the divide between uh, the, the aforementioned, um not pillaring but the uh, the the uh, there was the, the, I I guess I have to retrace my steps a little bit but it was kind of a, a bit of epiphany that finally cracked and it was like ah that's why the 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 veneration of the veteran mm -hmm. by putting him on a pedestal right became unsolvent it fell apart because it moved from 
seeing a consistency in things mm-hmm. like it, it, we can cons- let's just this is a generalization that i used in in from last week was um you know it's it's general that people in the rangers are brave because mm-hmm. there's a certain necessity for being able to do that but it's not being a ranger that makes you brave yeah. and that distinction the importance of that distinction is now leveled back on the gun culture as a whole where it's not really your background that right. gives you value here it's your character sure and that's such a maturing great description or, 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 or movement and i think that i mean you had a part to play in that again i'm saying you influenced me so i hope i hope i'm not being too much of a you know over the top on that one but then also how it goes with it, it, how it goes with like just how we look at things as, a, as, a, as our culture is like we have virtues I need to focus on those virtues, not on this shortcut to assuming virtue, which right. might be experience or something like that. Sure. I, I do appreciate that. Well, I think it's a definite shift that we're seeing um, in the last few years is that it's more and more acceptable. You don't have to be a veteran um, or active military to have a place in this space or to even be taken seriously or, you know, um, when it comes to even certain aspects of training or just as a, owning a company or, or putting out a good product um, or just the everyday person who's, who's getting geared up and, and seeking actual training and taking that time to better themselves both on and off the range. Um, that's something that for a long time, I think in this space was you were kind of looked down upon, but now you're, you're almost seeing a shift in focus towards the everyday civilian um, because I think that a lot of people are waking up to the fact that it is important to maintain these rights and own these and own these tools. Um, and it is important to have a certain level of training um, and know how around these these types of tools so you can use them accurately and swiftly if need be. Um, and even I'm seeing it with a lot of military, ex-military, I should say, or sometimes active military uh, who are doing in a training, working in a training capacity. A lot of them are shifting their gears to away from doing contract work with various units and shifting their gears to mainly focus on the civilian sector. And I think that's a huge change uh, in the culture and kind of a sign of the times because it's uh, it's it's very rewarding to work with everyday people who don't know a lot about something. And at the end of a course or at the end of a few days of training with them or some ongoing uh, training, they start to evolve themselves and come out very much ready to be their first responder. Um, and that's, think, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I interrupted you. I thought you were pausing. I'm, I'm, go ahead. I'm, I'm paused. <laughs> do you think there's a danger? Do you think that I guess asking the question is wrong. Do, how much of a danger do you think there is of an inversion instead of it going from a, a, a balancing to an inversion where now the veteran is sort of, uh, look down on. Do you think that? And I'm not talking about like skill set. I mean, like that gun culture kind of becomes almost like the opposite of what it was. Like now, being a veteran is a detractor. Do you think there's a danger of that? Because I've seen elements of it pop up. Not- I mean, I think that would solely depend on on an individual case to case basis and how they conduct okay. themselves in the space. Okay. Um, because. Just because you're a veteran or you are active military doesn't make you somebody who is knows everything. Like as we've seen time and time again. Um, yeah. And I don't know if that's a little off of the question you're asking, or it's it's it, well, I, I, we've definitely cut, we've come to the conclusion that just because you're a blank doesn't mean you can do the thing, right? It doesn't right. mean that you're maybe you're an expert operator, you're great yeah. at the operator, but you're not good at instructing. You got to yeah. develop that skill set. But yeah. you know, and maybe you know, like just because you're in the military doesn't mean, as you know, like as Lucas Botkin is famous for saying, just because you're in the military doesn't mean you you, you know how to shoot is a true right. statement. But now yeah. my concern a little bit. I wanted your opinion on this one is if mm-hmm. the inversion becomes true and they're like, and where it's you're a veteran, therefore you can't instead we gave prop. We ascribed properties to people who were of the veteran that were considered positive. Now I I'm, I I'm kind of concerned of like the pendulum swinging so far that 
you have and part of this i am a veteran as well so like there's a certain personal nature to it but like i've almost seen elements pop up in in kind of like budding little plants on the ground or uh you know kind of like a odd odd bit of resentment uh towards the veteran resentment held towards the person who has done the job professionally and so they're artificially excluded from existing in you know grand scheme of things almost like oh well you're a veteran so you're necessarily a bad and it's like ooh i don't like I mean, that either i think that's going to be again it's going to be on an individual basis yeah. from the person who's casting those judgments um because you know you're going to have a lot of people who disagree with us foreign policy disagree with wars of the last 20 years or war in general mm -hmm. Um, so of course you're going to have pushback from certain people because that's what they believe. They, they want something more peaceful and they reject, um, the United States military or whatever for, for their own reasons. Um, from a training capacity side of things, I think not because if you're, if you're taking your training seriously, there's really no substitute for real world experience. Um, so if you're someone who wants to seek proper training out, like, yes, could somebody who is a grandmaster uh, competition shooter grab someone and take them? Never, never did any service or anything. Just you know, played World of Warcraft and shot pistols. Um, could they train somebody on how to become a fast, accurate pistol shooter? Absolutely. Like that is the person that you want to go to for those skills because mm -hmm. they know it better than anybody else, and they've proven that. But on the same token, if you want to learn tactics, if you want to learn CQB, if you want to learn things that professional killers for lack of better terminology can teach only they can teach that because they've had that real world experience. I should, let me, let me retract that. Only they can teach that to the level that um, would, no one else can really match that in my opinion, because if you've not been in those situations where you've actually been shot at and you've actually had those real world experiences, then in my opinion, uh, you're going to be able to offer something that others cannot. I, I think it's a it's a it's a weary it's a not weary it's a weary yeah, topic right. to traver, traverse yeah. and I'm and I'm I'm I am optimistic by the way that gun culture as a whole is trying to address it because right. we're 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 this is where me I get to be a philosopher again we are making distinctions yeah experienced versus a job S character qualities versus a skill set right courage versus strength you know like we're seeing these distinctions pop up. And then we're trying to figure out the relationships between them. And I think that's encouraging. Sure. I, I, I find that very encouraging. And, and some of it is very much so that's what I'm interested in. So I, to mm -hmm. a hammer, everything's a nail. I get it. Sure. So before we completely close off, yep. um, when it comes to your projects that you have going on, is there anything that ah, I think of, it's actually spring here where I live. So a bug just existed um it's almost there yeah yeah well back where i back in minnesota it's still it's still midwinter oh yeah um it's not it's not even midwinter it's like early midwinter um it's the dread month Mo Just Fe february is the dread month but uh the end of january into february but fine um what's new is there uh, is there uh, is there anything that's like that you're capable and willing to talk about that people should be looking for as far as coming out from you guys whether it's you know you've got multiple things irons in the fire i know i wanted to give you some time to like kind of i want to make sure that's there i want to make sure that that, that yeah, that's present i appreciate it and you, you mean as far as uh you cut out briefly so i'm assuming you mean as part of product development things like that new things we have going on Product program projects, things that are going in that things that, that are inside your company that you find exciting, things that yeah. are outside that you find that you find interesting, like what's a book you've read lately, or or you know yeah. any just go. I want you to like this is something not necessarily data advice, but like this has been good. I like this freestyle. Um, um, so as far as com the company goes, um, like I mentioned before, we are working on a new building, uh -huh. um, which is very exciting because we have reached our capacity over a year ago of our current space and things are literally on top of each other and everyone's working nuts to butts um but uh it's uh it's going to be a huge improvement and we're going to be able to change up the flow of how we do things to 
be able to crank out the products even faster and more efficiently and more effectively than we have even been able to up to this point. Um, and because of that, it's going to open up a lot of space uh, and time to work on other aspects of the business. And one of those exciting aspects is that we're going to start to approach into the retail space more. Um, starting pretty soon in the next month or two, I think, uh, with a handful of SKUs with lights, optics, And we're currently using and uh and that then we're selling so that's something that we're really very much looking forward to um and then the other thing too is that we have you've probably seen the snake staff uh everyday carry tourniquets have you seen those i, I think you've shown me them a little bit i i've definitely seen them but i would not consider myself ed educated uh, just talk just 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 go do it so so snake staff is a newer company and they've created two forms of everyday carry tourniquets and it's something as a company that really is a, it's a large proponent of, of uh, medical training and carrying medical supplies every day or the essential medical supplies as I would call it. Um, it's exciting to see other companies out there on the forefront of trying to uh, offer uh, solutions for everyday carry medical supplies and that's and that's one reason why uh, we exist uh, in the space that we do working on the medical solutions because we are huge proponents of carrying everyday carry medical and we want more and more people to do it and be prepared. It goes along with the whole mission statement, the whole idea of the brand. Um, so they've created these tourniquets. They're brand new. They're hard to come by because they've been running into issues. They've been selling out so quickly, um, but we we're fortunate to have a few. and We've been carrying them for the last month and a half. And it's definitely not an endorsement to go out and say, go buy these tourniquets because they are a new product. Uh, they are not uh, TCCC approved as of yet. Um, I think they're working actively on getting the approval and the thumbs up from that committee for the their wide version. Um, but they are very unique and they do allow you to simply carry a tourniquet with you at every step of the way in your pants pocket or whatever very, very easily. Um, and that's one thing we run into in, in this space is a lot of people Well, for one medical supplies aren't sexy. It's not like running through a building, you know, doing CQB or whatever. So people are less worried about carrying medical supplies, not as cool as carrying a gun. Um, but we are strong believers that if you're carrying a firearm, you should have medical supplies. And even if you're not carrying a firearm, you should have the uh, necessary basic training with med and carry it because um, you're more likely to use it for sure. Um, but these tourniquets are pretty cool. We've been carrying them. Um, the one thing that I don't really like is they get lost in your pocket because they're, they're small. Um, so we have created a holder for these uh, that should be hitting the market pretty soon. And it works extremely well. Um, and it's made, it's made out of shock cord and um, CNC cut kydex uh, with a, a discrete carry concept uh, HLR4 clip on there. So it goes right in your pocket like the size of a pocket knife. And uh, it allows you to quickly access these tourniquets. So we're working with them right now, and it's something that they might be interested in in picking up and, and kind of selling alongside their tourniquets. But if not, we'll release it ourselves um, to the market and uh, make that available for everybody. But that's where we're at is we're trying to formulate solutions for people so that they can be better prepared. And a big part of that is carrying essential medical supplies. Um, so what's the name of the company that makes the TQ again? The TQ is called Snake Staff Systems. Snake Staff Systems. All right. And then yeah. you're working on, you guys will, are looking at releasing something that will make yeah. the, the carry, the everyday carrying aspect of that just better for the end user. Extremely simple for the end user. <laughs> works, works every time, keeps it right there. One hand uh, deployment. Very simple. Um, yep. Go ahead. I think, so I, <sighs> There is an aspect to not caring or about carrying metal equipment that it isn't, it isn't sexy. It isn't like, mm -hmm. you know, it isn't, it is, it isn't Jason Bourne. Absolutely. However, th that gets overcome by the individual. How are yes. you guys, what do you guys have for solutions? Because to be clear on that, carrying a, a, an IFAC around every day is not convenient. It's Absolutely. just not, it's it not, con it's not convenient in the sense of like, it doesn't, it, so you guys have worked on some solutions to that though, right? We sure have. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So this is one example. Yeah. So, so carrying the tourniquet, that's one example because 
everyone should carry a tourniquet. Um, the other way is that, like you said, carrying a full IFAC around is just not going to happen for most people. Like, let's be honest. Like, I don't carry a fanny pack, not a fanny pack kind of guy that much. I don't have a backpack with me at all times. I don't wear cargo pants and shorts. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not that much of a gray man, cool operator dude or whatever. Um, <laughs> the most people will tell you, oh, I have an IFAC in my car or in my truck. And that's great because we also have medical supplies in our vehicles, as mm -hmm. you should. But when we're doing training classes with people, we'll often ask them, ask, you know, ask the class and they'll say, oh, yeah, I have an IFAC. Oh, yeah. Is it always with you? No. Oh, I mean, they're like, say, yes, it is. And I say, oh, how do you carry it? And they say, oh, it's in my car. So then we'll proceed to go over to them. We'll grab them by the arm and we'll say, okay, go get your IFAC. And of course they cannot go and they cannot get to their car because I'm physically holding their arm. And then they quickly, it's like, they, they put two and two together and they go, oh, wow. I understand what you're saying. Now, if I don't physically have it on my person, I'm in the mall, I'm in the parking lot, I'm in my house, I'm in, you know, wherever you are, if you're not at your vehicle or you're not within steps from your vehicle, when time is of the essence, when someone is bleeding out, uh, you just, it's useless. You might as well not have an IFAC, which essentially you don't. So I am a huge proponent of carrying medical supplies. I tried to do it in various forms that I hated, basically all of them, um, from the fanny pack to the to the pants pockets, to the backpack, to the ankle IFAC, all that stuff wasn't for me. So we created what we consider, what we call the KISS or uh, keep it simple medical pack. Um, so what that allows you to do is, is easily and comfortably conceal carry the essential medical supplies, which are your, which we've deemed to be um, twin hyphen. Any tourniquet of your choice that's a good tourniquet to carry, I wouldn't carry a rat tourniquet. Um, but if you're carrying like a soft T, soft wide cat, or even one of these snake staff tourniquets, uh, if you match that with our KISS med pack, which comes fully stocked, then you are ready to be your own first responder every time you leave the house comfortably and conveniently. Uh, you can carry those supplies. Okay, so this is again where technical difficulties might have gotten in our way or they might have not, and I don't want to risk it. So can you list the items that you think are necessary one more time? Sure. Yeah, so we have deemed for essential uh, everyday carry medical supplies to be twin hyphen chest seals, uh, Z-fold uh, military combat gauze um, with the, with the uh, x-ray ribbon, uh, and the roll gloves. So if you match that with any approved tourniquet, um, or a tourniquet that you see fit to carry. If you have those things on your person every day, then you are ready to be your own first responder every time you leave the house. Yeah. So the military combat gloss, gloss you said with the x-ray ribbon, I mean, I'm, I'm actually not familiar with that. I should be, but I'm not. It's just, it has a ribbon in it. So when it goes through an x-ray machine, they know it's in you. Yeah. So what happens is uh, there's, there's a LEO uh, grade gauze and there's like EMT grade gauze. Um, those two, for whatever reason, they don't have the x-ray ribbon. So we use the military combat gauze, which is the green package, which you'll often see. And that has an x-ray readable ribbon throughout the whole Z fold of the gauze that then when you are at the next level of care at the hospital, um, when you're getting that x-ray of where the wound's been packed, they know that they've gotten everything out, um, Good. when they move it to, to clean and flush and, and take care of the wound. Okay. Yeah. And then there is a, have you ever run into issues with people like shellfish injuries because you can't do the, you can't do all the quick clot stuff. So quick clot doesn't have that impregnated in it. Um, okay. it's, it's, uh, there's a different type of agent, um, that is, is impregnated in quick clot. Um, but the shellfish allergies aside, um, the, the ones that do use that, it, they have taken out the allergen and left the clotting agent behind so they it's such a very small amount that uh, people who, even with severe shellfish allergies it should not be an issue for them whatsoever because they've removed the allergen part of the of the product well this all goes to show that like my experience from 10 years ago was was right. was one thing and so like i'm i'm, I'm glad that things change like they do whether it's in Absolutely. individual individual manufacturing standards or cultural uh, culturally relevant subjects. So, well, Hey, uh, let's close off for today because we, we opened up the doorway to so many long chats, but we, we, <laughs> should, sure we should end for the day. 
should end for the show. Just to close off, where do people find you? Where do they follow your stuff? What's the best? What's the best interaction? Where are you guys putting your efforts in most lately? Where's the big, you know, where where where, where can where can you be found? Go ahead. Well, I'll before I say that, I noticed that you named the the show Jack Potter of Gorilla Tactical, which makes perfect sense. And I want to commend you on spelling gorilla properly because most people either spell it with one R or one L. So props for that. Um, we are most prevalent on social media, um, for better or for worse. Um, Instagram is where you're going to find the bulk of our media and, and most of our messaging and all the products that we offer there are showcased through our Instagram page. Uh, Instagram is gorilla, G U E R R I L L A underscore tactical. Um, that's going to be our main page. Uh, and there's link, there's a link tree in the bio with our website and Twitter and Facebook and all the other stuff too, YouTube channel. Um, but that's where the bulk of our media is going to be. Um, so if you want to hit us up there, there's an email tab as well that you can email us. We're very responsive. We're very quick to get back to you. And we try our best to respond to everybody who sends us a message on Instagram as well. So if you DM us there, we, we try our best to get back to you in a timely fashion. Um, and that doesn't even have to be about Gorilla Tactical or about a product that we offer. We are here to be accessible for the people. And if you have questions, concerns, um, life advice, whatever, we're going to do our best to help you out because we want to see you succeed. Uh, and we understand that without all of you, we would not be where we are today. So that never goes forgotten for even a single day. So we're here for that. I spelled it correctly because I've misspelled it incorrectly. There you go. Well, at least you're, at least you're, you're a good speller today and an honest man. So I well, that. at least, you know, I'm the speller. The honest man is always going to be in question. You know, yeah, never trust the man. man. Never, never trust the man on the other side of the screen is not a good. <laughs> outcome. I don't know. It's supposed to be funny, but Hey, this uh, it's Jack. It has been great to have you on. I've been wanting to have another long form conversation with you for a while. When I say another, we've never had one on camera before. Yeah. Um, part of it is um, you were the first guy who believed in the redacted project and you were the first guy to jump on in. And it's like, ah, thanks dude. Th there is a, there is a bit of like, I've been looking yeah, forward it. to having this conversation for a while. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming on and taking the time to have this conversation with us. So yeah, I, you, you know, I appreciate it. I really do. Now for those who are still listening to the show, we do appreciate uh, if you, you do the social things, you leave the likes, make the comments. If you want to start a turf war in the comment section on YouTube, apparently that's what other people do, whatever. Uh, but we do thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to the show. As I said earlier, the skateboard decks are coming out soon. If you are listening to this when it is releasing, this will be like end of February, 2023. Uh, end of February, beginning of March of 2023, the proceeds go to the, to the firearm policy coalition, or if anything changes between now and delivery, whoever we, whoever is best combating the, the brace ruling, but right now it's the firearms policy coalition. They're building the fund. They're building the chest to do that. Uh, that's the skateboard decks and it has on the front. It's the only one we're releasing this year. And it says on the bottom, uh, human privacy is not your property. A, argument against the government saying that they want to own you by owning your information other than that for us as we move forward um we have presented it at the beginning but we are opening up a subscribe star the operation season one operation two is a go postcards will be hitting the mailbox soon if you've not purchased something from our merch store i don't have your address i have nothing to mail it to if you also want to support the show, we do appreciate your time. Uh, but if you want to support the show for anything as much as like five dollars a month, you've got the uh, you've got our subscribe star, which will also get you access to the introduction to our operations, which come in the form of a postcard, and we'll stay connected that way. Other than that, this has been the Redacted Culture Cast. Thank you very much, and we will see you guys soon. Take care.